Play out, you know, a lot of times whereby, especially in South America as well, where some of the younger generation mm -hmm. uh, and, and children, etc., follow the, the same path as their parents or their father, should I say. So, do you think there could have been a chance that would have happened, or from what you saw and what you for him or for me? For you. Well, well, I know that for me there was no chance. Mm -hmm. I understood very quickly that if I try to follow my father's footsteps, mm -hmm. I will be dead already a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And if you check when my father died, I threat uh, the whole country. I say to them, I'm going to kill them all mm -hmm. myself, you know. And that was the biggest mistake I ever committed in my life. Mm -hmm. And thanks to that, I understood that five seconds of threats could become in 25 years of exile. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like... Uh, and I was very aware of the consequences of my father's actions because I was one of the men or the children who criticized him the most because he was surrounded by men who applaud him, you know. They were just encouraged him to be a warrior, to say, go ahead, Patron, you know, you are the man. Don't let anyone say to you what to do, etc. So it took me 10 minutes to realize if I was about to follow my father's uh, footsteps or not and then I make the call to the media again and I said I'm sorry I realize that there's no chance for me and I want peace I want uh, to do anything possible for the peace of my country because I remember in those 10 minutes there was very a, a, a very defining moment for my life mm -hmm. because I realized that I started thinking how I was going to avenge my father's death mm -hmm. and I was so scared of uh, what I was capable of doing mm -hmm. that I say to myself there's no point and I remember exactly in the same moment how many times I spoke with my father to say to him, look, you are doing the wrong thing. You know, you have to make peace with your enemies. You have to surrender to the government. You have to find a solution. There's no way out if you continue this way. I remember that I was bored when we were on the run because there was no home for us. There was no future. The feeling that you feel empty. You feel that you have nothing. You think you own the world. You don't own anything. Mm -hmm. And I remember some uh, very, what I think it was a very deep experience in my life when I was hiding with him. And of course, it was his last uh, part of his life. You know, it was like the last year when he escaped from La Catedral prison. Mm -hmm. And the police surrounded uh, the place where we were hiding. And we have to be quiet. We have to turn the lights off and uh, don't make any noise. So the police just looking around, they didn't find us, but they stayed there for more than a week. Mm -hmm. And we were running out of food and we were starting to starve, you know, to die. And I asked, and, but we have $4 million in cash. So I asked myself, what's the point of having so much money? And that was just a small part of the money we had, but you know, it was, $4 million, it was a lot of money, and, and we were starving, you know, it's like, what's the point? I don't know, I know, I'm not free, mm. I cannot just cross the street and buy a piece of bread, but I have $4 million, I can buy the, all of the food of the city yeah. mm. with that amount of money, but, you know, I'm not free, so I, I start to remember in those 10 minutes how many times I make some kind of claims to my father and say to him, look, why don't you find a way out? Because you are taking us to, to death, you know? And, and I was more conscious about his actions because as his son, I received all the threats. Once the enemies of my father realized that the only thing that could hurt him was if they hurt me, imagine. So I suffered the consequences of his actions right away. You know, this, uh, the second he made something bad, mm -hmm. I received the consequences. So that made me very aware of that. Mm -hmm. And that was what 
really changed my life, mm -hmm. to be so close to him and to feel the hate mm. of his enemies mm -hmm. so closely. It must have been pretty intense. Yeah. Yeah, to say the least. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and when somebody say uh, they are willing to pay a $4 million mm. for your head, and I was a 16-year-old kid, mm. you know, it's like, I did nothing, but somebody wants to pay $4 million if it's they crazy, kill me. Yeah, yeah. Very, yeah. Absolutely crazy. So it's like, you don't feel safe and you don't feel that your father is doing things in, in the right. proper way, in the right way. Yeah. So you start confronting him and saying, look, what are you doing? And it's like, where are you going? Where are we going? Where are you taking us? You know, it's like, when he started to listen, because it was very hard to listen, that's when he surrendered to La Catedral prison because he started to listen to me and to my mom. We beg him, you know, like, come on, man, let's stop this violence, there's no point. And he surrendered to La Catedral prison, but I think we were very naive as his family because we truly believed that he was going to stay there for a long time. He was going to confess his crime. He was going to just get out of the business and don't so, do any... So do you think he did that just to, uh, to appease you guys and to keep you happy? Or? I don't know why he did that because I remember the first time when I visited him at the La Catedral prison, the first thing he did, he showed me how he was going to escape from his own prison. Okay. You know, it's like... He built his own prison, he paid for that, he pushed the government, you know, he forced the government to build the prison he wanted, but he just was there for the past month and he was not, he, he al already knew how to escape, you know, it was like... Destiny, you already envisioned what was going to happen. Yeah. yeah, and I remember that every place he visited, it, he, he never asked where I'm going to sleep. The first question he asked is, how I'm going to escape from here. You know, it was like, uh, I don't care if there's a bed or not. I don't care if I'm gonna be cold or no. How I'm going to escape from here. That was the, the first question he asked. He so never played. geared to survival continuously. Absolutely, and you know, he was always a step ahead. Mm -hmm. Always a step ahead. And what makes my father like a very extraordinary guy, mm -hmm. he was, his capability of thinking ahead and and knowing what you were going to do. You know, it's like he designed a way to send cocaine to the United States. And he was using like jeans, you know, he put uh, cocaine inside, I don't know how, but they just did something and they put inside the clothes the cocaine. So when the jeans arrived to the United States, they washed them and they take the cocaine out of the jeans. So it was very difficult to know if you, I can show you a pair of jeans and it's just yeah. cloth, no more than that. So when the DEA discovered the, the cocaine route, my father, I remember he said to his men, I'm gonna do it again. And of course everybody said to him, look, Patron, there's no way you can achieve that because they already know that you are sending the cocaine inside the jeans. But this is how his mind worked. He thought that if he didn't put more cocaine inside the jeans, he, he just sent the same jeans, the same uh, model, everything the same, but he didn't, he didn't put anything inside. So the DA start washing all the jeans and they find nothing. So they throw, throw to the garbage all the boxes. And it was the boxes who contained the cocaine. Okay. Yeah. To the garbage, okay. you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know how it, So he was so intelligent that he knew that if he sent just the same jeans without any kind of drug, but he put the cocaine inside the cardboard mm -hmm. boxes. And he realized somehow this will end up in the trash. Mm -hmm. And he just needed to send his guys to, the, to collect the trash mm -hmm. and they will know what kind of boxes because they were marked. So it was very easy. In a way, he put the DEA to work for him, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. They helped him yeah. because he was thinking ahead, mm -hmm. you know. He was thinking like... Uh, and most of the times, he really achieved a lot of things thanks to that, you know. 
So do you think he was a, a very creative man? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Very, very creative. And do you think that led to his, his success? Yes, mm -hmm. and I remember another example. He took me, he, he once, he told me, I was like eight, nine years old, and he told me, I'm going to take you to a land strip, you know, where, where the planes uh, land. And he took me there. It took us from the Hacienda Napoli like three hours by car. And there was a place and he said, look, here we are. We are standing in the land strip. I look around, it was impossible for a plane to land there because there was a big terrain, but there was a house in the middle. So it was impossible that if a plane cra uh, land there, it will crash against the house. Mm -hmm. And I told him, there's no possibility, there's no chance for any kind of plane to land here because there's no place. Mm -hmm. And then he took the walkie-talkie and he gave the order, move the house. And the house was standing on wheels, you know. Okay. Yeah. And so the, the DA was just looking at the satellites and of course they took photos and there was a house in the middle so there's no chance. As the, the same thing I thought, there's no possibility of any plane landing here. Yeah, but if you move the house, you have enough. Yeah, yeah. And so he designed that, he think that, you know, he was, okay, let's put a house on wheels mm -hmm. and we will put it in the middle of the strip and when, once we need it, mm -hmm. we move it and we put it back just for five minutes mm -hmm. to, so the plane could land and, and take off again, you know. It's amazing, it's just his ingenuity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, it's, he find very simple solutions for very complicated problems. That's very hard, you know, because perhaps the solution is already there, but it's so complicated that you cannot see it. Mm -hmm. But he did it, you know, he was Just like broke always... It down and stripped it back. Yeah, yeah, he was always, always seeing a solution. Mm -hmm. I can give you a lot of examples, you know, when the authorities sees his, uh, all the zoo, mm -hmm. and he, they took the zebras, mm -hmm. he painted uh, the donkeys, okay. yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And he's changed, you know, mm. and he paid for the, the guy who was taking care of that. I, okay, how much money do you win during a year? Mm. I don't know. Okay, I will give you 10 years in advance. Mm -hmm. But I want to put these donkeys and he, he painted and he took the, the original zebras for him again. So it's like always cheating, always thinking how to win no matter how. Mm. So he's just determined, you know, when determined. you always... Uh yeah. It's the only option. Uh, the only option. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when he played soccer, mm -hmm. it was very funny to see him play because it was like the, the, the soccer game never stopped until he was winning, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. There was no, no 19 minutes. Mm -hmm. It could be two, three, four hours mm -hmm. and, and he started to, nobody wants to argue with him, you know, the, the referee. Penalty? No, no, there was no penalty. Okay, there was no penalty. <laughs> and uh, he didn't have the any kind of uh, embarrassment to say, okay, you're making a lot of goals from the other side, just change your t-shirts and now you play for me. Okay.